So next, I want to introduce about the interrupts. Interrupts, as we mentioned earlier, are supported by using dedicated hardware. And this hardware uh, is built into the microcontroller. They will respond to events from outside the microcontroller or microprocessor. The outside events will uh, alert the processor that input is ready or some other you know, functionalities uh, is ready or has to be taken care of. Really the information or the meaning of the interrupt depends on who generates the interrupts. Um, it will go through several steps uh, internally when the processor responds to such events. The processor will suspend what it's currently doing. It will invoke uh, its corresponding interrupt service routine. And then the interrupt service routine will do uh, it, the things it's supposed to do. And most of, of the time, it will interact with the application. So this is a diagram illustrates what the interrupt service routine is um, doing and how it interacts with the real domain application. Interrupt service routine, or ISR, is a very short subroutine that handles the interrupt. Now, short is a kind of a vague description, but uh, it should not you know, take extended a long time or uh, waiting on other things that may not happen. We expect the interrupt service routine to be completed as soon as possible and dedicatedly for that particular interrupt. So what we see here is basically two things are happening at the same time, concurrently or logically. We have the processor doing some setup code uh, for its main application. Let's say set up the uh, GPL registers to uh, turn on and off the LEDs. Well, things like you know, your main application is supposed to do. Then it will also register the interrupt service routine. Now this step will differ from microcontroller, from microcontroller to microcontroller. Depends on how um, the processor architecture is designed, uh, you may be using different ways to um, do that. But you should you know, basically use this at this step to let the microprocessor or microcontroller know this is your sub interrupt service routine for this particular interrupt. Some microprocessors may have multiple interrupts. So it's even more important that you register the correct interrupt for that interrupt service routine. If a microcontroller has only one interrupt, and then chances are you, know, you don't have to differentiate. So that's the only interrupt service routine you may have for this particular microcontroller. So register the interrupt service routine is important. That's the first step you have to do to ensure your interrupt is gonna be handled by the correct ISR. Once you do that, then you can proceed on your normal task. Uh, your main application will be here and the process will execute your main application or task code uh, you know, continuously. Because we're talking about embedded applications, so you will expect to have a infinite loop such that your main task will be executed you know, all the time without stopping. But while you're doing that, this interrupt service routine has to be in place somewhere in your you know, program segments, uh, in your program memory. It may not be activated until you really see or receive an interrupt from the outside world. And that's this you know, lightning strike refers to. This lightning strike, strike is a uh, indication of an uh, external event that the processor has to respond. Uh, it may be saying from the um, UART, a new byte is ready for you to read. Uh, or uh, this could be a um, warning uh, signal from your temperature sensor 
where it indicates uh, or some um, your other device which sends the temperature sees a uh, warning sign say your um, current temperature exceeds the threshold so it's beyond the safety requirement uh, or the threshold and that's a dangerous signal so those that could be another interrupt type of interrupt so this interrupt could be uh, different from case to, to, to case and electrically the interrupt could be level based or could be trigger based um, so you could be raise the um, voltage level too high or too low or generate a pulse um, both are possible so but regardless once this happens the processor will do so-called contact switch so it will finish the very last instruction if the processor is still executing that instruction and then it will start the contact switch by that we mean this processor will set its program counter to this isr the entry point and then the next instruction will be the first instruction from this isr so this isr Whatever program, whatever instructions you put into the ISR will be executed. Uh, you can have a certain program logic within ISR, but you should not have a very long subroutine that will take extended time. And the main purpose of this ISR is to respond to this interrupt. Again, it's, you know, the actual operation will be certainly different from case to case, but the main purpose is to deal with that interrupt. Once the ISR is completed, it will um, you know, return to the main program. So it will resume uh, to the um, main application and it'll, the processor will continue from whatever instruction uh, that uh, it left out um, before the context switch. Okay, so this diagram on the top here shows um, the addresses for at mega 168. The first column is the address. And the, uh, you can see that these addresses all corresponding to one jump instruction. For this particular microcontroller, these addresses are fixed for these um, interrupts. So if there's a reset, this jump instruction will take the microprocessor microcontroller to the function called reset. And for um, the second one, address two, you will take that to uh, RQ zero handler. So these will be the um, kind of the entry, entry point to these ISR routines. And these are met the program addresses, not data memory addresses. Uh, as these low-end microcontrollers, they always have separate program memory um, from the data memory. And that's called the hover architecture. For modern microprocessors like an Intel microprocessor, they have the same address space but for um, these low-end microcontrollers, they always have separate program memory and uh, data memory. So the triggers uh, could be a level change on the interrupt pin um, to indicate that uh, interrupt happens. Uh, you need to, um, you can also use um, software interrupt. So those interrupts are not really a external signal connected were sent to a interrupt pin. These software interrupt will be triggered when you execute a special instruction and write to a special register. The response from the microprocessor will be disabling the interrupt so the SR can be entered uh, safely. It will push the current program counter onto the stack. This is important. The current program counter really points to the next instruction in the main program. By pushing the current program counter onto the stack, 
the microprocessor will be able to get back to where it's being interrupted. So we can resume the execution of the main program. And then the next step is to execute instruction at a designated address. And that's in fact the entry point or the first, uh, the address of the first instruction in the SR. We should do a few things in ISR. We should save and restore any registers it uses because when you get back, you want to be able to restore the original values of the registers. It's similar, you do a function call. Uh, if you took microprocessor one class, you know the call conventions. Uh, when you have a C program, you call a subroutine or sub function. The first few interactions will be uh, those, you know, pushing the registers into a stack to save the value. And once the subroutine finishes, then pop them back to the register. So we're doing this. We should do the same thing in the ISR to save any values that you may corrupt during the execution. Also at the end, we will re-enable the interrupts before returning from uh, the ISR. Again, this is an example of Berkeley microblades. Um, what we show here is the memory map. So we have a 32-bit address. So it's a, it's a very large range. Some of them are unmapped. Uh, some of them are really the real uh, memory, like in this range from 4F to uh, FFF. On the very top, this is the interrupt and exception handling table. Really these places, um, the, these addresses like 0, 8, 10, 18, 20, and uh, these several ones, these are hardware uh, specific addresses. So what this means is that when this microcontroller gets a reset, so it will be, you know, power recycle or you know, it will be starting from scratch. What is the first instruction this microcontroller will do, will execute? It will find its instruction from this address. That's why we say this is start and reset this will be the address that uh, the microcontroller will find its instruction. And this underscore star is the software label that you can use uh, to refer to that instruction, to the address of the instruction. And we have interrupt handler, which is at address one zero in hexadecimal. So that's address 16. So also part of this region here. So that is the address where the microprocessor will find its first instruction. And that instruction can take you to you know, other places using a jump. Um, so you can see this whole memory region from zero to all the way uh, eight Fs, they are segmented into several sub-regions and that's how they uh, do this memory mapping. Uh, from using the color, you can easily see this region is mapped for real memory. So you can store data and, and uh, um, you know, read data from this region. If you want to operate on um, UART microcontrollers, you'll find these controller and its uh, internal control registers using this memory range. So from uh, 8400 uh, to, to FFF. So this range is where you can find the UART controllers. Timer registers are mapped in this region, and um, you know you can find other um, resources. Interrupt controller in this region here. Um, again, you know this is just example um, that's uh, included in this set of slides. Uh, when we talk about the uh, Atmega 2560 microcontroller uh, after midterm, uh, we'll know more. Uh, we're going to look at probably this uh, slide and maybe similar, similar slides uh, again to see how its memory um, are mapped, if there's memory mapping, and how we're gonna access these controllers, uh, these individual resources. So don't be you know, puzzled or um, you know, confused by this memory mapping. Uh, here, I just wanna use as an example to show you what we mean by memory map 
and uh, how we can possibly find these different resources. I noticed there is another question. Let me check that. Okay, so why is there unmapped area? Very good question. So we have a such a large memory space. Uh, if you use the 64 bit, you can probably figure out it's I think 32 gigabytes of memory space. Uh, do you think that you will be able to find a you know, um, 32 gigabyte of um, memory chip for a embedded microcontroller which you know, has only a few things to do? The answer is probably no. Um, so even though we have such a large memory space, we do not have to use all the you know, memory spaces, memory areas. And these areas, these, these um, you know, numbers, it's not something that we assign. This is um, mapped by the microcontroller by design. Um, now, you may ask you know, why they do that. Uh, very good question. I, I don't think I have a good answer. But uh, you will find such cases that uh, you won't be able to fill your resources to the whole memory region because you have such a you know, large memory region. These unmapped area uh, only means that they choose to um, map certain resources uh, at different places. Uh, one reason that I can guess is you know these memory bits. So you can um, these bits will be different. So let's say this uh, upper bit all four zero. This is a one a zero. So these particular bits, I think bit thirty one, thirty two, um, that bit thirty thirty is a one. And this, um, you know, these indi individual bits are happen to be ones, and that's how they get this particular address. It's really not that important. Because as we explained earlier, these addresses are often time um, hidden in the microprocessor's you know, resource or header file, header files. So a register, if it is allocated in this memory region, you will often time find the name of the register is mapped to a particular address. So to you, it's really not a big deal where exactly they are mapped as long as you have a way to refer um, to them. We are gonna see, we're gonna see the actual code um, in you know, probably 10 minutes. Okay, one more slide about microblade. Um, again, don't take this uh, as something that you have to remember. Um, this is just you know, saying that uh, this particular microcontroller supports one external interrupt source so you can imagine that physically, this microcontroller has one pin uh, that can be used to um, send interrupt signal in to this microcontroller. And this pin is con connected to the interrupt input port. The processor only react to interrupts if the interrupt enable bit in the machine's status register is set to one. So this interrupt enable bit in this MSR is set one. This is often the case you know, for many microcontrollers. Although the, the exact control register's name is gonna be different, uh, you may call it differently, but there's always some bit in that register is called interrupt enable. Interrupt enable, you can think about this as like a you know, master control bit. You, if you set this to one, the interrupt is gonna turn on. Uh, so the microprocessor will be able to respond. Doesn't mean that it will, it, it doesn't, so when you have interrupt enable pin is set one, does not mean you currently has interrupt pending. It just enables the function, enables the interrupt function so that your interrupt service routine uh, is able to be triggered. On an interrupt, the, intru in the instruction in the execution stage completes while the instruction in the decode stage is replaced by a branch to an interrupt vector. So this is really some details um, internally when the processor core is executing instructions. 
it goes through several stages, instruction fetch, decode, execution, and sometimes write back. So this is really give you some details about what exactly happening when the microprocessor is executing another instruction at the same time the interrupt happens. The interrupt return address uh, is automatically loaded. So that is the basically the uh, next instruction the microprocessor uh, was you know, planned to execute if there were no interrupt. Uh, now we have interrupt. So the, that instruction, the, the addresses of that next instruction will be saved so that later on when the ISR finishes, the processor can get back. In addition, the processor also disables future interrupt by clearing the interrupt enable bit in a MSR. So it's done by the microprocessor automatically. The IE bit is automatically set again when executing the uh, interrupt uh, return instruction. Um, this is a quote from uh, one of the pioneers in, in computer science, computer um, you know, design, uh, Digistra. Um, this is from the article, The Humble Programmer. Uh, he wrote that, you know, basically saying interrupts are evil. Um, you know, in one or two respects, modern machinery is basically more difficult to handle than old machinery. Firstly, we have got the interrupts occurring at unpredictable and irreproducible moments. I think that's, those are the two key words uh, you may want to remember. If you want to remember something from the side, uh, this is really saying that the interrupts are asynchronous. You don't know when they're gonna happen and you oftentimes cannot reproduce. And compared with the old sequential machine that pretended to be a fully deterministic automaton, this has been a drastic change. And many system programmers, uh, gray hair bears witness to the fact that we should not talk lightly about logical problems created by that feature. So, um, of course, interrupts is not the end of the world. It's actually the beginning of a new world. Uh, but the, the fact is you will have to deal with these unpredictable, irreproducible moments. Um, the um, program design is more complex. People have to uh, think more carefully about how they um, deal with uh, such concurrent events. And we're gonna be talking about these uh, concepts and these examples in more detail. Hope you guys are still energetic. Okay, so let's talk about uh, one example of interrupts. Time the interrupt or timer. So what we see here is a typical um, way to use a timer or time the interrupt. On the left side, you see that the procedures for the processor to set up such a timer interrupt. It will first um, do its usual setup work. Enable, um, you know, for example, the interrupt the enable bit or other things. And then the next immediate thing the processor needs to do is to register interrupt service routine. And this interrupt service routine, as in our example, is for the timer interrupt. So whatever we want to do uh, when the timer expires, and that should be put into this interrupt service routine, which is typically defined in a separate function. Here we just use um, uh, statements, um, programs to register that ISR to this particular timer. Then we'll initialize the timer. Initialize the timer um, can be a, a few steps. Uh, we can see from an example shortly, but initially we will have to decide what will be the initial values of the timer, uh, how long the timer will expire, uh, things like that. So the timer is a hardware unit, a hardware controller within the microcontroller. 
So you will work with the timer unit through registers. As you work with many other components within the processor, you always use registers to do that. So it's important to uh, understand what registers are involved and then be able to uh, work with those uh, registers accordingly. And the next thing is to, uh, for the main purpose, for the main task, the next thing the microprocessor is supposed to do is to execute the task code. So that this is the main uh, function you are operating. On the right side, what you see here, uh, this is, uh, you can think about this is the hardware timer unit, which will be counting um, you know, the, the time um, ticks uh, based on how long uh, your time, the time elapsed of your timer that you configured here. When timer expires, this interrupt will be triggered. Uh, like any external interrupts, uh, this timer interrupt is often the time uh, internal, but this is treated as the same way as the external interrupts. It will um, cause the normal execution of the main application to suspend. The microprocessor will jump to the interrupt service routine, which you register here at the beginning. And then in that interrupt service routine, you will do some updates typically a counter. Um, so you update your ticks, your uh, sample, uh, whatever variable that you want to uh, record, um, you know, the, the, the times or number of, you know, uh, or um, anything you want to do in ISR will be done here. Um, and of course, it's going to finish at some point and then that will let the processor resume the execution of the main task. What it doesn't show here in this diagram is the interaction in terms of the, the shared variables between this ISR and the main function, uh, which, you know, in fact, you will see more clearly through the examples in later slides. The ISR will also be responsible for reset the timer so that the timer will uh, redo the counting down or counting up. Um, and then so that the next time my uh, expires, it can interrupt the processor again. Um, so the reason we have different colors is because this timer unit is really a hardware based. You are not writing code to um, you know, update the counters in the timer. This is done by hardware internally as a part of the microcontroller. This is the software code you will write uh, as the ISR for the timer interrupt. Let's use eight, uh, this microcontroller AT Mega 168 to show you how we can set up a timer to trigger interrupt every one millisecond. So we'll first look at some of the registers we'll use in this um, procedure. This TCCR is the timer counter control register. Uh, this one is, you know, you will find such a control register for any timer in any processor. You will find something like this, although this name could be different. This control register is typically used to um, set up the mode of the counter, uh, you know, enable the interrupts, um, uh, uh, all these sort of control operations. Uh, this OCR is the output compare register, and this is really set the, the values of the timer in the sense that, you know, how long the timer are gonna expire when it, after it resets. So this value is programmable and often is based on some calculation um, you know, if you want to have a timer, say in our case, one millisecond, using the frequency of the processor, you'll be able to figure out that. And we'll show you how we do that calculation. Timer interrupt mask is a, another control register you can use to 
uh, enable or disable the interrupts for timer particularly. Uh, we're going to be using a term called prescaler value. Uh, you will see how uh, we use that. But essentially, this is the value to divide the system clock uh, so that we can use some much slower clock to drive the timer. On the left side, you will see some descriptions for this process. We assume the processor runs at 18.432 megahertz. And we will use the timer unit. What we want to do first is to set up an interrupt that will occur every millisecond. To do that, we will be able to generate the timer interrupt at every millisecond. Uh, once uh, everything is set up, then our ISR can be executed. But let's see how we can make that happen by leveraging the timer unit in this microcontroller. We will enable and set up this timer interrupt using the following code. We have four lines here, and each line is to assign a value to a particular register. This is TCCR1A, TCCR1B are part of the timer con counter control register. Uh, you will see these names differ from microcontroller to microcontroller but you will always find something similar. The first two lines of the code will put the timer in a mode that it will generate interrupts and reset the counter when the value reaches the value of OCR1A. So these two values, what matters is really the particular bit in this value and also the particular bit or bits in this value. Because these registers each bit will mean different things. So when we assign these values to these control registers, they will set or reset some of the bits. Um, you can look into more detail looking at the data sheet uh, to find out what are the bits in this register. But overall, these two lines are uh, helping us to set the timer so that it will generate an interrupt and reset the value uh, using this value uh, every time when the timer expires. Also, as a part of the control register, we set the prescaler value of 256. You know, interestingly, you don't see the 256, the value show up as the value here, because as we said earlier, the bit in this register really you know, give you that value or, or a, even a different value if you choose to. This prescaler value means that the timer will run at 1 256 speed of the processor. So the timer will generate ticks uh, at really 18.432 um, megahertz divided by 256. This will be the new, the new the value that you get from this division will be the uh, frequency of the time ticks of that timer. And the third line here is 71. Um, this is the reset value, or you can think about this as the initial value of the timer. This value will be counting down uh, every tick. And once it reaches to zero, an uh, interrupt generates. So what we are doing here is um, to find out the value that we want to assign to this initial value or reset value of the counter, uh, we will use this formula. We'll use the processor's frequency divided by the prescaler value, which times the interrupt frequency. So this 256 times uh, 1,000 because this 1,000 uh, millisec, uh, sorry, uh, microsecond, because uh, this the first value is in megahertz, uh, so we convert that to um, microsecond, and then use that value subtract one because we count from zero. So the the final result is 71. So the 71 should be the value as the uh, initial value or the value that 
has to be reset to the counter uh, when the timer expires. Finally, we use this last line to enable the timer interrupt. Okay. So with these four lines, we are able to set up the one millisecond interrupt such that we will, uh, the microprocessor will receive the interrupt every one millisecond. So if next we can, you know, tell the microprocessor that the interrupt service routine, the particular interrupt service routine associated with this interrupt, then we're all set. Then we will achieve our goal of using um, that timer to do something every millisecond. Um, so I, I want to stop here for a moment for you to think about the way you design your first lab. I didn't talk about timer interrupt for the Arduino. I do not require you to use timer interrupt for the first lab. But at this point, you should realize it's possible to use a timer interrupt for the first lab to count the um, number of seconds remaining for a particular light, for the particular color of the light. Um, you can look up some of the online materials to uh, find out how you set up um, timer interrupts for Arduino. But as I mentioned, you, you're not required to use that. It's fine if you use the delay function to count time and counting down. Uh, but there are options. Okay, back to this um, processor here. We're seeing on the left side a few lines of C code. These few lines essentially translate what we just described from the previous slide into program um, segments. In the main function, we assign these values to these four registers and we explain what these registers are. But really, the, when you use this TCCR1A or TCCR1B and other registers, the reason you can use them is because these registers are defined in this avr slash io.h. When you have a SDK from a microprocessor vendor, you will have example code like this. If it is in C, uh, it will include any header files. And you will find out such you know, similar lines like this, these ones that use register names as the variables and you can refer to. These names, definitely they are defined in one of these register. I'm sorry, one of these header files. Let me see another question. Is 71 decimal or hexadecimal? Uh, it's decimal. So these are defined uh, because these registers are memory mapped. But how, you know, exactly what, where is this register? How, we are, how are we uh, able to access these registers? The question is, you know, is valid because, you know, we show, you know, we didn't show header file. Uh, we just show here, use the register name, but we'll see uh, shortly how these register names are translated into actual code um, at low level uh, for C compilers to uh, properly handle these addresses. On the right side, I don't wanna go into details. These are the um, logical functional diagrams for this timer. Uh, it has, um, few registers that you can see, TCCR, 
N A R N B. N refers to the number for the timer controllers. The microprocessor or microcontroller may have multiple timers. So you find for this example, TCCR1A, and if you use a different timer, that will be TCCR2A. Uh, likewise, OCR1B or OCR1, uh, OCR2B, et cetera. Also, this diagram shows uh, how the prescaler value are factored into uh, the control logic of the timer, like here from the prescaler, uh, will you know, basically um, scale down the system clock and generate another internal clock for driving the counters down. Okay, now we have a few more lines of code. Hopefully these code will uh, explain how um, we go from the register names to the actual code. So what you see here, uh, a few things. This is the initialize. You can think about this as the part of the main function. Uh, you also find these four lines that we referred to earlier. It's a little bit different from the previous implementation, the previous uh, slide where you uh, see, um, you, know, you don't see these ones, underscore BV, underscore BV. Um, let me start from here. So yeah, so when you refer to TCCR1A, and we can see this is another header file defines exactly what is TCCR1A. This is in IOMX 8.h. Again, these names, file names are not important, but this definition line define, this is the, uh, in C uh, syntax, this defines a symbol and it's coming from another symbol, uh, underscore SFR MAM8. SFR stands for Special Function Register, MEM8, so it's an 8-bit register map uh, in a memory address. The parameter here to this uh, macro, another macro is 0x80. Okay. Now if we go for the, on the chain, so underscore SFR underscore MEM8, that is defined here, and it will take one argument as the memory address, and this is in fact underscore memory map IO byte wide data, and that's the memory address. If you look into further, that's defined as this. So eventually when you use TCCR1A, this left part of the assignment statement is gonna be recognized as this, okay? So what is this? If you're familiar with the C syntax, this is really to say, uh, we wanna use this value here, mem underscore ADDR, as the address. This address points to a location that stores the 8-bit value. And when we do the assignment, we essentially use this value to replace the value in that memory location. Okay, so that's how you uh, essentially translate this um, register names to the actual memory, after loca memory map location. On the other hand, we have a few other functions we have enable interrupt, disable interrupt. We have signal, uh, that's the um, uh, memory, uh, that's the interrupt service routine. Let me go through a few things that I just mentioned. Um, wait. Yeah, so here is the interrupt service routine and uh, here's the uh, delay in millisecond uh, this is part of the function you will call. And 
this here will be, um, so this timer count will be decremented um, every time this timer interrupt happens. Okay, so this slide summarizes what I just explained earlier, how this line is going to be eventually translated into C code. So there's a few macro definitions, but essentially we're going to use this 80 as the memory map address so that we can refer to that control register for timer one. So I spent quite some time to explain how this particular register is mapped or translated into this uh, memory address. Really, this is specific to this AVR uh, ML 160 microcontroller. You will certainly find different register names for uh, the ML Mega 2560 that we use or any other microcontrollers you may use. But the concept and the way these header files are defined are very similar. So I hope you can learn some, you've learned something from the first several slides, uh, how these register names are eventually translated into the actual memory addresses. Um, any questions so far? Okay, so let's look at the next example. This is the um, micro blade board that UC Berkeley used for their class. So they show the example how to set up a timer to trigger a interrupt every one millisecond. The code is in C, uh, but it's very similar. So in the init function, you'll first set up the timer um, elapsed time. So how long is the timer gonna expire? They call this function sysTick period set. Uh, this is the processor clock divided by 1000. That will give you the number of cycles per second. And we're using one millisecond. So we're gonna be you know, divided by a thousand to get the number of cycles per millisecond. That will take care of the initial values of the timers. And then we'll do tick enable to start the system tick counter. And then we enable the timer interrupt. So the um, timer is out start working. And once the timer expires, it will generate interrupts. On the other hand, if we want to disable the timer, we'll just disable the system tick. Um, then we'll call this function and do the reverse. Okay, so let's hypothetically look at this example where you want to do something uh, using timer, but you are not uh, really doing the things that infinitely. In this example, what we want to achieve is to do something for two seconds and then stop. Okay, it's different from your traffic light controller uh, it could be different from many other applications where your task is going to be doing um, a particular thing you know, endlessly uh, in an infinite loop. But in this example, we are performing some function, some calculation, let's say, uh, for two seconds and then stop. So how do we do that? As we see here, in the main program, we will first register a interrupt service routine. This interrupt service routine is gonna be uh, counting a timer count. And 
this is where it gets interesting. You can see this is the, the case I was talking about where the ISR um, interact with the main function using a shared variable. So what is the shared variable here? Oh, I don't hear any volunteers. Um, uh, time count? Yes, so time or count is the shared variable. Um, and in the main function, we initialize the counter to be 2000. And we know earlier that the timer interrupt that we uh, set up was for one millisecond. So our hope is because the timer count is set up as 2000 and every one millisecond, this counter will be decremented by one. Why is that? Well, because we register this ISR function here for this one millisecond um, timer interrupt. And because of the timer, one millisecond timer interrupt, this ISR, this function will be called once every one millisecond. And because our initial value is 2000, so we'll, you know, we expect that this will be uh, called uh, at least 2000 times until this timer count value equals to zero. So if it's not zero, if this counter value is not to zero, meaning that we haven't really gone through the whole two seconds yet, so this part of the code will still run, this while loop still goes on until the timer count reaches to zero. Um, looks reasonable. Um, so first of all, we notice here, in terms of this program segment, we have to declare this timer count. This is where we need to be careful. We need to declare this as a static variable. And it has to be declared outside the main function because this variable should be accessible to both the ISR and the main function. When you put this declaration outside these um, function scopes, this will become a so-called global variable. So this will be allocated in the uh, heap rather than the stack of these individual functions. So that's one thing. The second thing, you notice here is we use a keyword volatile. Volatile is a keyword in C to tell the compiler that this variable may change at any time and not entirely under the control of this program. Now you may, you know, they're not sure about you know what this means, but this is important, especially when you have um, caches in microprocessors. Caches are small memory units that you will uh, find in modern microprocessors. And these caches are um, used to store part of the data that you often use. Um, you don't have to go to the main memory and you can just load the value that you recently used from this cache so it can speed up your program. They are useful, however, they are very sensitive to situations like this. If you have a value cached, uh, stored in the cache, then you know, it, there's a risk that this ISR function or the main function will not see uh, the real value um, due to the, um, you know, due to kind of the conflict that you will, um, the, the updates will not be reflected right away to um, be visible to either of these um, functions. So volatile really 
tells the compiler that this value should not be um, cached in a way to, um, they should be uh, treated to um, if, uh, effectively, to immediately uh, uh, update it whenever um, this value is updated in memory. This ISR, as we explained earlier, this is a function. You will use this function for, you know, you can use a different name. It doesn't have to be ISR literally. You can have, you know, other names. But you will have such a function. You have the operations defined in this function as the service, as the particular operations. And you register that to be your interrupt service routine. Once you register, then when interrupt indeed happens, this function will be called. Because earlier we set the system tick as one millisecond. So when this um, interrupt is enabled, this ISR will be called every one millisecond. So here we're gonna talk about the important concept of concurrency. Concurrency refers to the fact that logically you have two parts of the code going on at the same time. One part is the main function. So this function is gonna be executed, especially when you get to this while loop. So this while loop will go on for some time. But logically you can view this ISR is also active because from time to time, in fact, precisely every one millisecond, this ISR will be executed. So during the whole process, this ISR is not done. Um, you know, it has to be called again and again. Also the main function, especially the while loop, is also uh, being executed. So this is what we call concurrent code they logically run at the same time. In this case, between any two machine instructions in the main, an interrupt can occur and the upper code can execute. So concurrency is a good thing, but uh, you will see right, you know, right now there's um, things that you need to consider to be careful. The question you want to ask on this example is, is there an issue with this code? You can't trigger any other interrupts? Um, sorry, I couldn't hear your voice. It's very... Uh, noisy background there. Can you speak up and we'll see it again? Okay, any other volunteers? Okay, so the comment was, uh, you won't be able to use any other interrupts. Um, that's a good point, uh, but here we're not uh, saying that. Um, we, we, we didn't prevent the microprocessor to enable other interrupts if there are more than one interrupt. So what if the interrupt occurs twice during the execution of this code? Okay, uh, considering the time, let me go on. So let's say if your timer 
at this point, when you execute this while loop, your timer count is one. Okay, and when you check this condition, it's not equal to zero. Right, so we're going to be going into this whatever code you have within the while loop. We're going to be executing this code, and we expect this code to go on for two seconds. So that's a long time. So you will likely to have uh, this ISR, this routine to be called multiple times. Let's say this call ISR is called twice. Now, when you enter this while loop, well, when you at this point, your timer count is one, and then you have two interrupts, then your um, timer count, this value will be decremented twice. So that'll become a minus one. And what is the problem with the minus one? The problem being that we have a minus one as the timer count, the next while loop is still not equal to one. Sorry, it's still not equal to zero because actually you bypass the zero. So you never reach the true condition or false condition of this um, check. And your counter keep, keeps decrementing. So you, you're gonna be you know, having a negative value, but you will never um, reach to this um, condition that ending this while loop. Um, so we improved this example, we'll do some checking uh, to see if the counter uh, is zero or not. Uh, based on that, we'll decrement. Uh, you can take a look at this improved example. Um, I see we're running out of time. I will um, have to probably end the lecture today. We only have a few slides left. Uh, I think we can quickly cover that in the next class.